morning, church. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Wonderful to see everybody here. I'm trying to fight with these fans because I like them. I like the cool breeze. I love the palm trees. Welcome to New Salerno Beach. Good. What a wonderful place. You know, a lot of people that live down here year round, they don't realize. Glorious place that we live because all you got to do is take a trip up to New York. <laughs> or even Boston this week. I mean, I never heard somebody cry so bad. You know, you live in Boston. Oh, we're going to get snow. Well, you live in Boston? Hello. <laughs> I think we're getting pretty weak as a nation. I, I really do. I don't understand that. I mean, I, I grew up in the snow. I loved it then. I hate it now. That's why I'm here. <laughs> hey. He is not a Jew, which is one inwardly, but outwardly. Now, hey, let me just start. I'm going to start all over. <laughs> For he is not a Jew, which is, one, which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. So what is that saying to us? If you're a Christian, right, then you're a Jew. Do you not follow a Jew? Jesus was a Jew, wasn't he? Okay. So there's no anti-Semitism here, right? Okay. The, the title of this sermon is God has a tipping point. And I'm not going to explain that to you now, but it'll explain itself as we go. Um, we're going to talk a bit today about faith, and we're going to talk a bit today about pride. And pride, in my opinion, is our biggest obstacle. And that's what I prayed about when I was asked to preach. I said, Lord, what do we need? <coughs> What do we need? And I really think that the Lord is telling me that pride is the problem. Because pride is at the root of every single sin. It's pride. You know, the devil, was, when he was created as Lucifer, he, he was created beautiful and perfect. Full of wisdom and glory. I mean, God couldn't have given him anything more than he didn't give him. <clears throat> Okay? But he corrupted his wisdom because of pride. He thought he was something else. And Jesus, Jesus, who is the one that deserves to be prideful, if anybody should be prideful, has never been prideful. But is the most humble, the servant of servants. Jesus came to wash men's feet. Do you believe that? He came to save their souls. He came to die for their sins. He came to be an example. He came to live a life that we couldn't live. See, because God only accepts absolute perfection. He won't take anything else. That's why the very best of anything that man could offer if he laid it at the altar, even the angels would veil their face. Not good enough. Therefore, God provided what he required. Absolute perfection Amen. in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And he has given him to us for not just a moment, but forever. Amen. Amen. It, 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 it is a mystery that we will spend the rest of forever and eternity trying to understand how Jesus, 100% God and 100% man. And it's an amazing mixture of how he did this thing to save us. It's, it's mind-blowing. We're going to discuss some of these things today. Let's look over. We're still in Romans. Let's just look at Romans 3.11. What is that saying? Romans 3.11. There is none 
that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Pretty strong statement. Let's turn our Bibles to Isaiah. Go a little bit left in your Bible to the book of Isaiah. We're going to do a, we're going to stop here and do a little reading in the very first chapter of Isaiah. Isaiah was a was quite a prophet. You know, and, and, and Isaiah, Isaiah himself was a prideful man. He was humbled. You know, he thought he was all that. You know, he's walking down here and he, you know, like, I'm not a sinner like these guys, you know, he's, look at all these people. And then what's he do? He gets translated into heaven in vision before the throne. And what does Isaiah do? Oh. He starts quaking and shaking. He says, whoa, woe is me. I am a man of unclean lips. You know, he got, he got straightened out but quick. And I think it's, you know, God is giving us the opportunity here and now today to get straight and to get right and to lay down all this pridefulness. This pridefulness is very natural for us. I don't care if you're a man or a woman. There's woman pride too. Yep. Just as well as there's man pride. Even though men seem to carry it around a little bit uh, more frequently. Men seem to think that their their ego is their amigo. My best friend of mine. You know. But it, that's not the way it is. <clears throat> All right, beginning in Isaiah, um, verse 1. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Azah, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass, ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. A sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers. Children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness but in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with appointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. The, and the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we have been like unto Gomorrah. These are strong words, aren't they? You know, the Lord has a very, very tough job to break through to the heart of man. Because man's, it's said right there. I mean, there's no soundness, bruises, and putrefying sores. We're desolate without God. There's no help. You know, you can't fix this thing. God says there is no fix. The flesh must be crucified, brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus came as an example. He was crucified for you. That was you and me hanging on that cross. That's the gift of God. There is no way around it. There is no other Savior. All right? Jesus said, I am. You follow me? He is the God of the here and now. Not yesterday, not tomorrow. Jesus is the God of right now. And, and, and now right now. You follow me? That's why he says, I am. That is a powerful, powerful statement. I want us to turn to Jeremiah. That's just a little book to the right. Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17. Popular chapter. You probably should have been there before, I'm sure. Probably should be some rules. 
little digs in there, little ruts in your Bible, maybe some scratches. I like to hear the pages of the Bible. It's a beautiful sound. Isaiah, or Jeremiah 17, beginning in verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man. That's pretty plain, isn't it? Yeah. Pretty plain. Don't look to the man. Look to God. And maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the hurt heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord, in whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, that spreadeth out her roots by the river, and shall not see when the heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. <coughs> Praise the Lord. The next verse here. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Lord searches the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his way and according to the fruits of his doing. Hmm. Some say it doesn't matter what you do. What does that say? Sure does matter what you do, doesn't it? Yeah. You better be looking to the Lord Jesus Christ. No doubt about it. And then I want to read from 16 to 22. As for me, we're still in chapter 17. As for me, I have not hastened from being a... No, that is not what I want. Well... I wrote down something here that I don't even know. I can't even understand it myself. So. <laughs> no, Isaiah 13. I'm sorry. No, Jeremiah. Jeremiah. I'll get it straight. I don't know. Maybe I need to take a drink. <laughs> Jeremiah 13. Isaiah 13. I just want to keep you guys on your toes. <laughs> Isaiah 13. I told you I like to hear them pages, sir. <laughs> Isaiah 13, beginning in verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity, and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Isn't that beautiful? God really wants to do a work on us if we will allow him to do that work. I want you to turn to Isaiah chapter 2. <clears throat> for the fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. It's pretty self-explanatory, isn't it? Isaiah 8 and verse 20. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. The Bible here says to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Now I want to read you something from one of my favorite authors. Um, this is from the Acts of the Apostles. Okay? And 
I'm just going to jump into it. You'll understand that. Some of those whose voices were now heard glorifying a vile sinner, and but a few years before, raised the frenzy cry, Away with Jesus! Crucify Him! Crucify Him! The Jews had refused to receive Christ, whose garments, coarse and often travel-stained, covered a heart of divine love. Their eyes could not discern under the humble exterior, the Lord of life and glory. Even though Christ's power was revealed before them in works that no mere man could do, but they were ready to worship as a God, a haughty king, whose splendid garments of silver and gold covered a corrupted and cruel heart. Herod knew that he deserved none of the praise. You hear that? He knew that he deserved none of the praise and homage offered him. Yet he accepted the idolatry of the people as his due. His heart bounded with triumph and a glow of gratified pride overspread his countenance as he heard the shout ascend. It's the voice of a God and not a man. But suddenly, a terrible change came over him. His face became pallid as death and distorted with agony. Great drops of sweat started from his pores. When I read that, I thought, boy, what a contrast. Here we have Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane taking upon the sins of the world, sweating drops of blood for us. Here's a haughty king wanting to take all the glory that God deserves. But now he's sweating. Great drops of sweat from his pores. He stood for a moment as transfixed with pain and terror. Then turning his blanched and livid face to his horror-stricken friends, he cried in hollow, despairing tones, He whom ye have exalted as a god is stricken with death. Suffering the most excruciating anguish, he, he was born from the scene of revelry and display a moment before he had been the proud recipient of the praise and worship that the vast throng, that the vast throng, now he realized that he was in the hands of a ruler, a ruler mightier than himself. Remorse seized him. He remembered his relentless persecution of the followers of Christ. He remembered his cruel command to slay the innocent James and his design to put to death Peter. He remembered how in his mortification and disappointed rage he had wreaked an unreasoning vengeance upon the prison guards. He felt that God was now dealing with him. The relentless persecutor, he found no relief from pain of body or anguish of mind, and he expected none. Herod was acquainted with the law of God, which says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Exodus 23. And he knew that in accepting the worship of the people, this is why I say God has a tipping point. Listen to this next statement. And he had knew he had knew that in accepting the worship of in accepting the worship of the people, he had filled up the measure of his iniquity and brought himself, brought upon himself the just wrath of Jehovah. Brothers and sisters, God has a tipping. God is so kind and so loving, and that's the reason we're still here, because He wants more people to be saved. He wants people to be ready. And I know a lot of us sitting here, our loved ones are not ready. Our children are running around in the world. But God isn't going to wait forever. There will come a day, just because God doesn't settle His accounts every Friday, doesn't mean that one day God will not send his accounts. 
Brothers and sisters, if you're living in, a, in an area away from God, you're in a very, very dangerous place. Even if the cup really looks good on the outside, you're only fooling yourself. The Lord sees straight through the heart. And He has said that the heart is desperately wicked. We need to let go of all of this pride. And I mean pride of heart. Not, not just pride as if you have pride in your children or you have pride in your, your vehicle that you clean and take care of because it takes care of you. I'm talking about heart pride. I want to clarify that. And I want to confess something to you, my brothers and sisters, that I did this week that was so wrong and prideful of myself, and I, I hate the fact that God even made me say this. But I, I was in a big hurry this week. I had a lot to do, and I was in a short time to do it. And I got loaded up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and there was this fella in what, what I call a hot shop truck. They're, you know, it's a pickup truck with a 40-foot trailer. In my opinion, they steal all the big trucks light freight. That's just my opinion. <laughs> But anyways, that isn't why I was like I was. I, I was, you know, I was in a hurry to get here, and I got there, and again, when I got there to load, the gal in the guard shack, she said, oh, I got to call you in real quick because we don't have, to have time to do the paperwork. I got to get you to I said, that would be fine. And I, I'm acting like it's all fine. I've been running like crazy all day to make this all happen, you know, making pickups. I just barely got in there under the wire. Well, they get me loaded. The stress is finally coming off. And I'm getting loaded, and here's the corner of the building, and this guy's parked right on the corner, and he's chaining down his stuff, and there's all this room where he could have pulled way up. Well, he didn't pull up. He just parked there. Well, I'm coming around the corner, and, you know, my truck's 70, 76 feet long, so I just can't leave it on the corner. So when I got there, I, I had to go around him and pull up, which is no big deal. I mean, we're going to both get out of there at the same time. We both got to go get paperwork. But he flipped out. I mean, he made his face and threw his hands up and everything like that. And I thought, well, you stink. <laughs> so I pulled right up to the stop sign. And you know what? If I would have been, if I would have been praying, or if I would have had my heart in the right place instead of being prideful, see, I was offended. I shouldn't have been offended. Because I was offended, I thought, well, I'm going to humble this fella. <laughs> no, really. I didn't think that thought, but that's what really happened, okay? Well, maybe I did. I don't know. So I get out of the truck, and I got my bar for doing the thing, and I'm carrying that with me. And I can't remember if I carried it all the way to him or not or if I set it on the trailer, but I was walking with it. He saw it. And that guy, I could see him. He had fear in his face then. And I was kind of happy about it. Because <laughs> I didn't like what he did, right? So I walked up to him, and now it's just my ego, right? You see in this wickedness here? My ego. And I walk up to him, and now that I knew I was shaking him a little bit, I walked right up like, oh, man, what's wrong? Now he's really freaked out. You know what? And he says, oh, man, I, I says, well, I saw you throw your hands up and everything. You all right? He oh, says, man, says, I'm sorry. I'm real sorry. I'm just having a bad day. I'm having a bad day. You know what? I, I was just happy with that. I shouldn't have been happy with that. That man was humble. Okay, fine. If I'd have had a step to Christ in my pocket, if I'd have shared with him a piece of bread of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you know, I didn't. I didn't. Because of my own pride, and I always do, but I didn't. And I walked away, and I didn't. I was so prideful that I didn't even think about it at that moment. But you know, I've been praying for that man ever since then. I can't, I can't pray and not have him in the back of my mind and somebody reach that man. Because I had the perfect opportunity. The perfect opportunity. And I didn't do it. Because of my pride. And you know what? I think this whole situation was because I think the devil has something to do with this garbage. Because when I thought about this and prayed that, 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 that pride is what we need to be discussing here, Look what happened to me. I allowed it to happen to me. The devil took me away. And God allowed me to see exactly what happened. 
you know, because I'm going to get up here and preach about pride, it maybe should be one of you guys, because it shouldn't be me, not this week. You follow me? I should have given that man a piece of bread. Anyways, thank God for forgiveness. Let us turn our Bibles to Romans. Romans chapter 1. Beginning at verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, and it is, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image made like unto corruptible man, into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Let us turn our Bibles to Romans 3. Just turn the page, probably to most of you. And I want to read you about the righteousness provided in Christ. Beginning in verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. You see, it's one thing, brothers and sisters, to say that I have faith in Jesus, right? It's another whole thing to have the faith of Jesus mm -hmm. living in you. You see, the things that I now do, I don't do of myself like I did for a moment. Thank God for His forgiveness. Amen. See, we're all in Christ, but is Christ in you? When Jesus Christ died on the cross, brothers and sisters, He saved all men. But all men don't choose to be saved. Mm -hmm. All men don't cherish this beautiful and glorious gift of justification. See, because when you cherish this beautiful gift of justification, when you keep it, you love it, you adore it, you know what it becomes? It becomes sanctification. Not just you in Christ anymore, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, His righteousness that they may be just, that He may be just, and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what? Law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also the God of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. 4-5 But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for 
What's it say? His faith is counted for righteousness. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's turn our Bibles over to Romans 5. I want to talk about the, the effects of justification. 5 and verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through.